When I started teaching at Reading University, I found that uh, I had a colleague slightly older than me, David Crystal, who was taking the whole field of prosody and turning it upside down and shaking it hard uh, to see what came out. He had radically new ideas, or it seemed to me, on how we should look at this subject. Uh, essentially what he said was, if intonation and uh, other aspects of prosody are doing anything for us, the system that we use is much, much more complex than the simple picture portrayed in books like O'Connor and Arnold. And he demonstrated this very thoroughly. Before he finished his doctorate, he was working with Professor Randolph Quirk and began publishing with him in the early 1960s, 1964, I think, um, and then later produced his big book on prosodic systems and intonation in English in 1969. And for most of you, that period is ancient history. Uh, but to me, it was the time uh, when I felt that my ideas about prosody were completely changed, uh, and I began to appreciate just how much there was that we didn't know. Crystal was very concerned about the relationship between prosody and the rest of the linguistic world, and he suggested that we should consider a continuum. There's a line on this slide. I don't expect you to understand this slide instantly because it's trying to put a lot onto one slide. But here is a, a horizontal line with an arrow at each end in the middle there. And at one end of it, you have aspects of prosody which are most closely linked to linguistic structure in um, the language of the person speaking. At the other end is what he called the least linguistic end. And this is where prosody merges in with other aspects of um, interpersonal behavior. And what he was uh, proposing was that at the most linguistic end, we have things which are uh, systematic or systemic um, in a closely defined way. So, for example, it's possible to say um, if there are three levels of stress in, uh, in English, those three levels form a, a, a self-contained system and they interact with the, uh, the lexicon and the grammar of the language. At the opposite end, uh, we have things like voice quality, which really does not have any kind of system to it that we know about. Um, it would include also, if you go further, um, things like facial expressions and gestures. These are all in the general field of prosody, but you can't possibly work out an easy transcription system that would help people in understanding or learning a language. They're very interesting aspects, but they are, uh, if you like, on the fringe. They're on the outside. And some of them are really quite funny. I, I remember reading articles on proxemics. I don't know if you've come across the science of proxemics uh, to do with um, how you position yourself physically in relation to the person that you're speaking to. I, um, I never really thought much about this until I went to, to work in Spain. Um, in England, we tend to keep quite a long way, uh, quite a big distance between us and the people we're speaking to. We don't like to get too close. And when I got to Spain and I found that people would stand very close to you when they were speaking, and sometimes I'd be walking down the corridor and my head of department would come and put his arm around my shoulders. <laughs> I'm English, I don't do this. Uh, so this is, if you like, at the extreme end. This is going beyond prosody, but it's in the same general field. It's interaction between people, and we have to find a way uh, of, of accounting for it. In his earliest uh, work, Crystal proposed a fairly short list of uh, um, prosodic features. Uh, tone, which covers most of intonation. Tempo, the speed at which we speak. Prominence, which is obviously related to stress. Pitch range, rhythm, and voice quality. Um, later on, he modified this to some extent. And I haven't been able to put the whole thing on the screen, but I just want to get the general idea across to you. Um, he put at the most linguistic end the use of pitch, 
and he divided that, he subdivided it, as I've tried to show here in the bottom left-hand corner, pitch direction, so that that would account for things like pitch rise, pitch fall, and so on, and pitch range, so that the difference between, for example, no and no would be accounted for as a difference in pitch range. Pause was uh, promoted to a much higher place in his, uh, in his list, and I think we all know that pause is not random. We all pause. We don't just pause at random, or very rarely. It may be for physical reasons. Sometimes we run out of breath, and we must stop and breathe in again. Um, but in many cases, we pause in a way that clearly links the pausing to syntactic structure. Or, in a rhetorical way, we may pause immediately before a word that is so important that we want to make sure that nobody misses it. Okay. Um, loudness uh, is a rather unsatisfactory word because, um, uh, again, we all know, stress uh, in its phonetic manifestation is, uh, is not simply a matter of how loud a syllable is, other features are much more important, the pitch prominence, the length, and so on. But it's certainly, certainly loudness uh, in general does play an important role, and it's one that's been rather neglected. Tempo is another very neglected area. Um, most textbooks seem to assume that everybody speaks at a constant speed. Now, I've done a lot of work on uh, tempo, uh, on speaking rate, um, and uh, it doesn't take a brilliant phonetician or a large laboratory to work out that there are times when people speak quickly and there are times when people speak slowly and there are people who speak very fast and there are people who speak very slowly. Um, some of these things are linguistically important, some of them are simply a matter of personality. Rhythmicality, another area that I find very interesting. Um, Crystal's position on this was that uh, it's wrong to say that there is a very strong rhythm and, and characteristic rhythm to English. However, we all have the ability to speak in a rhythmical way if it's appropriate at the time that we're speaking. And then finally, voice quality, which I won't really go into here. This is when we're getting outside the uh, area of linguistics into what is often called paralinguistics. Uh, certainly a lot, of great, a lot of study has gone into the field of voice quality. Um, all of us are aware of some of the variations in voice quality that are used. You only have to listen to television advertisements to know that if somebody is selling something very soft like soap or toilet paper, they use a very soft voice like that. And if they're trying to sell you a big four-wheel drive truck that will go up the side of a mountain, you'll have a really big rough male voice like that. Um, so voice quality is used in, in various ways. And, um, uh, another British phonetician, John Laver, uh, devoted quite a lot of his, uh, uh, of his career to f building up a very uh, elaborate and sophisticated framework so that uh, any voice quality you could produce would fit somewhere into his, into his plan of, of, uh, of voice qualities. And he even produced a kind of ear training practice similar to the ear training that we give in IPA symbols and uh, uh, pitch rises and falls, so that his students had to sit in practical classes going, uh, making sounds like uh, and uh, things like that. And apparently anybody who walked into the room while these were going on was uh, uh, wondering what on earth was happening. 